Well, hello and welcome to another podcast from the Herefordshire Light Infantry. Another walk in the sun. And this time, Paul's allowed me to do the introduction. So, welcome from the Reverend Paul Roberts and myself, Kermandy Taylor. It's great to be here in the museum, having a look round, being able to explore in a little bit more detail this week some of the exhibits and items we have on display. There are lots of good things here. And as you said in the last episode, they're in chronological order. But we do have one case, which is for new acquisitions. Mm. And there are always some interesting things in here which appear. And just to perhaps draw your attention to a couple of these things. Uh, the first one is this Territorial Efficiency yeah. Medal uh, with a King George VI head on it. There's no ribbon on it and it looks a bit battered. Hardly surprising. It was dug up <laughs> by road workers on the side of the A49 just north of Lempster. And they cleaned it up or the individual who found it, cleaned it up, and then presented it to the museum. Amazing. And given that history, you wouldn't think it had been lying underground for, well, who knows how many, how many years? Uh, absolutely. There was no ribbon or indication of a ribbon with it. But yes, yeah, so it, it's Corporal Bassett, who lived in Lempster and in, had enlisted into the Herefordshire Regiment before the Second World War. Mm and served all through the Second World War, rising to the rank of corporal. So it just shows that bits and pieces come from everywhere. They come from all over the place, that's right, and people are kind enough to uh, to donate items to uh, to the museum. Medals, just one of the, the different types of, of well, items is, we get, aren't they? And of course, next to uh, Corporal Bassett's medal is the medal of Quartermaster Sergeant Moore. Mm. This is a Territorial Force Efficiency Medal, and it was awarded in 1912 to Quartermaster Sergeant Moore. And his regimental number is, wait for it, number one. <laughs> uh, so when the Herefordshire Regiment was formed in 1908, the regimental numbering started at number one. And the Quartermaster, being the senior volunteer soldier in the battalion, was allocated that number, That's number right. one. And the museum was lucky enough to purchase this at a national auction uh, just a couple of months ago mm -hmm. uh, for a very reasonable sum. And we had support from the friends to, to acquire that medal. But a great feature and a very important part of the regimental history, because it's number one, but indicating as well the, uh, the rank and status of the quartermaster sergeant, I, what would now be called the Regimental Quartermaster Sergeant, and the uh, the volunteer ethos of the the reserve forces. That's right, because these these long service medals recognise that that length of time put in by uh, by the the volunteers themselves, doesn't it? Those twelve years, which in the Second World War, war service counted double, and I believe in yes. the First World War as well. Yes, didn't it, it did. Yeah. So if you had for most people who enlisted before the Second World War, like Corporal Bassett, uh, when, if you saw the war all the way through, you pretty much automatically, through that double service mm. of time, got a, a Territorial yeah. Efficiency Medal. And of course, though, because in the Second World War, the campaign stars and medals weren't named, often it's the only named medal in a group. Yes, it is. And, and, and it then enables you to, uh, to identify the recipient of those groups and then learn something about mm, their history. Absolutely, that stepping stone into the past. But the other things that we've got in here, and, and this slightly makes me feel old, is because we've got items which have been donated to the museum, which are no longer uh, in the equipment table for the regular army, but they're equipment that I wore when I was serving. <laughs> and that makes me, don't laugh, Paul, that makes me feel very old. <laughs> and certain items from, you know, 58 pattern webbing, Anyone that served between about 1960 and probably mm, oh, past 2000 mm, would have mm, worn mm. 58 pattern webbing and would know and either love it or more likely <laughs> hate it. Uh, but there are things like uh, uh, skidded arm record cards and notebooks, all of these things which we had and were issued to us, which are now confined to history and museums as they are no longer issued. Mm. So... 
it, it, it's an interesting time, I think. And the, the whole concept of museums and collecting and holding things is interesting because when does something become a museum piece? Mm. Uh, does it have to be uh, 100 years old, 50 years old, or six months old? If it's no longer current, then it's, then it's history. So an interesting time, I think. That's right. And, of course, it all tells the story you know, of what it was to, to serve either in the regular army or the reserve forces at that time. You know, we quite rightly hold those important items like Dönitz's car pennants that we talked about last time but in a sense some of these more I suppose you might say mundane items mm. they are just as much a part of our story uh, as those uh, those sort of headline yep. exhibits yeah you're right and, and I think one of probably the I can't remember which general it was now that said the army marches on its stomach mm. if you think about what's what what supported the army when they were in the field or on operations and the type of food they mm. had there were what was known as composite rations. And in my day, these came in 24-hour packs for one man, four-man packs for 24 hours, or 10-man packs for 24 hours. And they were full of all sorts of delicacies, which people either loved or avoided like the plague. And they gave them their nicknames. There was steak and kidney pudding, which was known as snake and pygmy pudding. There was cheese processed, which was known as cheese possessed. And it often was. <laughs> and then there was a bacon grill, which was known as bacon gorilla. Mm. And if you speak to any of the soldiers who endured these rations in the, the 80s and the 90s, probably the 70s as well, they would have all had their favourites. And they, just the names bring back stories. Mm. Absolutely. And we've been trying to acquire, haven't we, Andy? We've been trying to acquire some examples of of these rations of course by definition at the time they were either eaten or, or discarded often in the skip load yeah but trying to trying to get hold of an unopened tin of um steak and pygmy yeah. nowadays it's pretty challenging it's, pr it's pretty hard work isn't it and uh, on a well-known internet auction site occasionally unopened tins of uh, such things as compost sausages mm. do appear and they sell for tens of pounds i mean you know for a tin of an open tin of sausages i think the last tin i saw was i think it sold for 84 pounds mm, mm. well they were one of the items which people loved or hated so you either ate lots of them or you threw lots of them yeah, away yeah and there are always trades to be done weren't there with if oh yeah you always wanted somebody in your section who liked something that you didn't and you could do a trade with that's, them that's right and, and in each pack as well there was a pack of extras which included powdered tea horrible stuff powdered milk powdered coffee chewing gum and toilet paper and you had 10 sheets of toilet paper now this wasn't really a problem because compo had <laughs> uh, one of two effects on you you needed more than 10 sheets of toilet paper or you never needed any sheets of toilet paper <laughs> so you found a pal who had the opposite effect and then it all worked out it all, okay. It all worked out in the end, as it were. <laughs> as they say. <laughs> so if you, at the back of the cupboard, have got a, a tin of, of compo that you're willing to, to donate to the museum, and if you still want to do that, discovering how, how well they go on eBay, then that's very noble of you. But we're always on the lookout, and that's for our, that's for our sort of post-war display, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is, yeah. And, and we, people will remember cooking these tins up or warming them up in their mess tins of hot water and then using the hot, tin, mm. hot water to make their tea or even shaving in it. And over the Tommy cooker with the hexamine blocks. Mm. And the smell of hexamine and trying to get it alight again, would bring back memories. But that's something we're not going to do in the museum. No, no. <laughs> no, Naked Flames in the museum is, um, is not, not a great idea. It, the Hexman block, of course, has only recently gone out of um, yes, gone it out has. Of use. They, they, they've, they've now got some, um, a tube, I think. Of, that's uh, right, a jelly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, which I've never used, so I don't, I don't know how it works. Mm. But I expect it feeds the soldiers just the same. Indeed, indeed, and I think it, it lights a lot easier as well. Than yes, hexi blocks. trying to lock, light hexi blocks in the in the wind in the rain was not always easy. No, no. And in those days, there there used to be lots of smokers around, and they were always uh, quite welcome when it came to lighting uh, hexi blocks. <laughs> and the great thing was to have Zippo lighters, which you could fill up with the petrol out of the out of the trucks if you needed to. But of course, 
Zippo lighters in the army have disappeared because now all the trucks are diesel. Indeed, indeed. Things have changed. So Andy, as we're sat in the museum here, I thought it might be useful to um, have a think about uh, one or two of these cabinets individually, these brand new display cabinets that we've got and that we're very proud of. The um, the one for the Boer War is particularly interesting. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that in common parlance, what do they talk about? We're going to do a deep dive, are we, into this case? A deep dive, absolutely. As long as we don't hit our head on the glass, we'll be absolutely fine. I shouldn't think so. And what we decided to talk about is the um, the Boer War, which was, can you remember, Paul? Oh, uh, South Africa, wasn't it? 1899 to 1902. I've got my back to the case, you see, so I'm... Um, That's why I'm testing at disadvantage. I'm at a disadvantage to you, Andy, although I, I'm sure you know all this anyway. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, the, the, the case is, is in front of us, and we've got three tunics, lots of photographs, some medals, some cap badges, and other bits and pieces. Now, when the Boer War broke out, in fact, technically, it was the second Boer War, Uh, broke out in 1899, troops were sent from all over the empire to uh, uh, support the British forces in that war, but they were found to be insufficient. And so a call was sent out for volunteers to augment the regular forces, and members of the Herefordshire Rifle Volunteer Corps volunteered to go and serve in South Africa. And they joined with members of the Shropshire Rifle Volunteer Corps And a company, a volunteer service company of 112 men was formed and they went and served in South Africa to augment the 2nd Battalion, the King's Shropshire Light Infantry, and they served for 12 months. Mm. I think I mentioned that already, but never mind. If I repeat myself, I'm sure you'll understand. It's all good stuff, Andy. (laughs) It's all good stuff. And that happened twice. One uh, volunteer service company went out in 1900 and one went out in 1901. And unlike reservists today, volunteers then were under no obligation to serve overseas, were they? So they had to, they volunteered to become members of the volunteers, and then they volunteered again to go to South Africa. Absolutely, they volunteered twice. The Rifle Volunteer Corps, which they were members of, had no overseas service obligation at all. But these men wanted the adventure, or perhaps wanted to get away from their wives, who knows? (laughs) But they volunteered to serve overseas for 12 months. They formed up into the company at Copthorne Barracks in Shrewsbury. They had their photographs taken in front of the officers' mess, which unfortunately was demolished about two years Mm. ago because the whole barracks was flattened and is now a housing estate, which is is a great shame given the the history and the association to the King's Shropshire Light Infantry and, of course, to the Herefordshire Regiment Mm. and the Herefordshire Light Infantry. But that's another tale of woe for another day. <laughs> and those pictures that in in front of the officers' mess, we have a couple of those, do we, in the in the case? Yeah, we do. We, we have the first volunteer service company and the second volunteer service company both complete in their uniforms. And it shows actually how the different uniforms progressed. In one, mm. they are wearing slouch hats, which are a bit like cowboy hats or the, the Australian a cap turned up on one side Mm -hmm. and in the other one they're wearing um solar topies the sort of the policeman's type helmet but uh in a khaki drill color so it shows how the uniform developed to cope with the conditions in south africa Mm. and what were the sort of things these volunteer service companies were getting up to when they were deployed in south africa Uh, they, they were used as a complete company generally Uh, But when they deployed in 1900, the real guerrilla warfare and the the, the mobile warfare had had finished almost. And they were involved with manning blockhouses, effectively checkpoints on the railways. The policy was to try and isolate the Boers so that they were... They couldn't move freely. They couldn't get to the farms and get foodstuffs and whatever. And it's quite a sad part of the campaign that this is where the term concentration Mm. camps came from. Mm. Unfortunately, that that term uh, was totally corrupted by the the evil that was um, endured during the Second World War. But during this period, the concentration camp was literally that. It was a concentration of civilians 
Uh, they were taken from their farms, put into camps, so that the farmsteads could not produce foodstuffs to support the um, the boars mm. there. Mm. And of course, not without a policy, not without its critics, even even at the time. E- even then, and um, I think it's the film "The Eagle Has Landed," where the uh, the spy, her parents had died in the concentration mm. camps mm. in South Africa which turned her against the British, and That's she was right, a spy her. for when the uh, the German paratroopers landed. Mm, indeed, indeed. So those of you that haven't seen that film, you will now have to go and look at it and look out for the, uh, the South African connection. find that motivation there. So if we look a little bit more into the, into the cabinets themselves, they're all bits and pieces related to those volunteer service companies uh, and their service service abroad. We've got um, we've got some uh, some medals there, the the red, black, and and orange ribbon, which I believe is the Queen South Africa medal. Is, I think is that right, Andy? I, I think you're right. I'm Paul. no expert I, I on medals, you as you know. <laughs> knew, knew a little of that. I think that was a loaded question. <laughs> but yes, the, the Queen South Africa medal, and it was awarded with bars, and there were state bars, and then there were bars awarded for individual conflicts. The state bars, places like the Orange Free State or the Transvaal. And then the specific bars were things like the Relief of Ladysmith, the Relief of um, Mafeking, Mafeking it, yeah. or Talana, mm. Diamond Hill, specific events like that. But generally, when the volunteer service companies went, the battles had been fought. So generally, they only had state bars on their medals. Mm. But the first and second volunteer service companies had different state bars on their medals. And we've got examples of both of them. It's also interesting because there's a a thing on um, one of the medals, which is known as ghost dates. Now, I thought you were going to ask me what they were. Well, I was. I was just peering into the case to to have a look for myself. But actually, looking at the reverse of that one medal, I can perhaps see what you're talking about there, Andy. Yep, absolutely. The original die for these medals had on them the, the dates 1899 to 1900. There was such confidence that the war would be over and British would be victorious in 1900 that the medals were struck with those dates on. However, that wasn't to be the case. And the good old British government, when they realised that the war was going to go on past 1900, rather than have new dies made, they ground the dates off the dies, or infilled them, whichever they did, and continued to strike the medals. And the medals, if they are polished, look absolutely fine. But when they start to tarnish, under Britannia's arm, the dates 1899 to 1900 appear. And they're known as ghost dates, which is always an interesting topic of conversation. Mm. And the medal we hold for Sergeant Hardwick is an example there. Very, very clear to see. Yes, it is very clear. Uh, Fortunately, as long as it's not cleaned, we can see them. Well, we we have a policy, um, partly on a manpower issue, as well as good conservation, that we don't don't routinely polish our silver items here in the museum. So there's no... We obviously monitor them um, uh, to make make sure there's no, um, no damage occurring, but polish in itself, particularly when it's um, done too vigorously, mm. it is a form of, of damage in itself. Yes, it, it is, yeah. And there's always a great debate about w- whether medals should be polished. And, and in fact, when we receive medals where they have been worn and the ribbons have, are worn, sometimes to the point of destruction, and there's always a debate about whether the medals should be re-ribboned and polished and produced in absolutely immaculate condition or whether they should be as the man wore them. And it, it, it's a difficult decision to make. And I think it depends on the group. In many ways, uh, we, we have had medals donated to the museum and the medal ribbons really have been beyond it, literally falling apart. So in those, we have re ribbon But others, which are just showing a degree of wear, mm. we put them on display like that mm. because that's how that man wore them. And some groups we've had the medals in the wrong order or even the wrong medal ribbons Mm. on the wrong medals. But that's how the man wore them. So it tells the story by not making them immaculate. Of course, it's treating each item in the right way, isn't it, rather than having a blanket policy for um, for, uh, whole states of uh, sections of accessions. And, and actually, funny you should mention blankets, because in the, um, the Boer War display cabinet there, we've got a piece of canvas. Now, it could be a blanket, it could be a tent, it could be a kit bag. We're not entirely certain what it is or what it came from, but it's from Claude William Hull, 
who was with the volunteer service company, the second volunteer service company, and he was out there at Christmas 1900, and he drew a KSLI cap badge mm. and a greeting for his family on the canvas, cut it out, and presumably sent it home to his family. Yes, it sort of says Private 7581, which is his his volunteer service company yeah. number, wishes all the home people, underlined, the merriest of Xmases and the happiest of New Years. Mechatterdorp, Transvaal, South Africa. And he's dated it the 26th of November 1901. So it gives you an idea of yeah. when final posting dates for mail from South Africa to the UK was, which is probably um, later than it is now, I, I would perhaps hazard it, a guess. It could well be. <laughs> but, but it's an interesting story about Hull. He was a volunteer in, in the volunteer service company in South Africa. He then returned to UK. He then emigrated to Canada. And during the First World War, he enlisted in the Canadian forces, mm. was commissioned into the Can Canadian artillery. And at the end of the war, we're not quite certain if he was ill or was wounded, but he returned to Canada and died in Canada uh, just after the end of the First World War. And as a result of that, he's been awarded a um, First World War memorial plaque, a death plaque. And we hold his medals here. And uh, they came to us about five or six years ago. But a really interesting package covering the first the, the, the Boer War and, of course, mm. the First World mm. War. And it's also interesting that his brother was Percy Hull. Oh, yes, he was the organist, wasn't he, at Hereford Cathedral at the time? That's right. He was quite a well-known organist, and he was a friend of um, Elgar, mm. Vaughan Williams, Benjamin Britten, all of the top people, and was uh, key in the Three Quarts Festival mm. as well. Mm. But he didn't have a particularly easy time. He was on an organ tour in Germany in August 1914 and was interned by the Germans and spent the war as an internee in Rulaben camp, which I think was in, was it Hanover or Berlin? I can't remember now. It was, it was certainly in North Germany, yeah. yes. The, uh, and it, it was the largest of all the internees camps, yep. wasn't it? Whenever yep. you hear, hear of civilian internees, that uh, the Rulaben is the, is the place. Yep. Lots, of, lots of merchant seamen were there mm. whose ships were in um, German ports or, or wherever. Uh, quite a few school teachers, actually, who were during their summer vacations were were over in uh, Germany, but there were thousands of individuals at the camp. They were quite well treated in that they could um, they could go out shopping. Um, they had uh, food stuff sent to them, and they could buy extra stuff and have it sent to them. They formed a camp government and had elections for it. They had shops, theatres, schools, debating societies, mm. theatres. So. It was, wasn't a, a desperate life, except probably for that isolation and just the desperation of not knowing when they were going to be mm, back in the right. UK with their loved ones. And, and potentially the feeling as well that they, they were, in terms of the war, there were things they should be doing and they, and they weren't, weren't able Absolutely. to do they that. Well, because could they well were... have been, but I, I think that um, there are quite a lot of photographs of um, Rulab and Kang. And uh, they, they seem, they have gardens and flowers and growing vegetables and all these sorts mm. of things. But I suspect towards the end of the war, when uh, foodstuffs and resources were getting scarce in Germany, I would think probably things were a bit more difficult yeah, then. Yeah, I'd have, I'd have thought so. So uh, an interesting connection there to, to a Herefordshire family, the, the Hulls, and, mm. uh, and, and that link there for, with the South African war we've got two there's two tunics aren't there and one mess kit they're they're all red that i'm sat with my back to them at the <laughs> moment so i'm relying on you Andy. Yeah, they, here. they are and in fact the two tunics are, are i think probably unique to the uh the harry Fitcher regiment and uh they are from the period 1900 to 1906 and they have embroidered on their shoulder epaulets one has one v Hereford. And the other one has one above HFD. Mm. So it's clear that they are both from the Herefordshire Regiment. Mm. The story how we acquired these is quite interesting in that they, they came from the courtyard, their costume department. They were having a clear out of all their costumes and they had quite a few military costumes there. And they asked me if I would like to go across and have a look at them. So I did, and I soon identified these two tunics and, think, and you know, knowing they were something special. 
And in conversation with the courtyard, they understood the significance of them and said that the museum could have them. Mm. But one of them has sergeant strikes, stripes on, marksman badge, and also the medal ribbon of the Queen South Africa mm. medal. Mm. So I thought we might be able to track down who this tunic belonged to. So written in the back is Al E A. So I thought, oh, oh. Sergeant Lee, yeah. I wonder. Mm. And, and I went and couldn't find anything oh. about Sergeant Lee. Lee. Or initials, maybe? No, mm. nothing. Anyway, I looked at the other tunic. That had Al E A mm. in it as well. So serious. intriguing. More and deeper and deeper, the mystery develops. I then spoke to the... Uh, uh, the, the wardrobe manager S and said, you know, do you know where these uniforms came from? And she said, oh, they came from the school's wardrobe department, from the local education authority. authority. Oh. So Lee was nothing <laughs> to do with the individual that received oh, them. Oh, what a, what a shame. Them, what a shame. And, yeah. and that combination of rank insignia isn't quite unusual enough, is it, to, to, to in itself? Well, it's not. And, and of course, and because, badges. Be, uh, but because the tunic was worn until 1908 mm. and it's got sergeant stripes on, in 1899 or 1900, he might have been a private, a lance corporal, a corporal or a sergeant or perhaps even a colour sergeant that, who, for whatever reason, was, uh, mm. was no longer a no, colour sergeant. No. <laughs> or, or indeed he may, may well have earned his Queen South Africa medal with a different unit yes. altogether and yeah. joined the volunteers afterwards. So it's one of those many things that will remain yeah. a mystery. One of the, uh, the great things that keeps the museum alive and interesting, but also in the tray over there, there's uh, the display cabinet, there, there, there's a, a silver pocket watch. Mm. Um, now, all of the volunteers from Ross on Y, when they returned after their uh, service in South Africa, were presented by the town council with a pocket watch, uh, thanking them for their service. And it's got a hedgehog. It's got a hedgehog. A hedgehog. Engraved, a hedgehog. <laughs> I just wanted just to Wrong get, teeth. I just wanted to see see you say that again, Andy. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's got a hedgehog engraved on it, and the hedgehog was the symbol of the Ross and White Company of the Rifle oh. Volunteers. Each of the Rifle Volunteers companies had an animal as their emblem. Oh, right. We know that Ross and White had the hedgehog, and there is there was a kestrel as well. But we don't know what all of the other animals were. Uh, we know what some of the animals wore, were, but we don't know no, which, which company they belong to. And it's 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 just not recorded no, anywhere. No, no. Again, more unanswered questions, isn't it? Yep. Why, you know, the hedgehog, you wouldn't necessarily think that as the, as the symbol of a military symbol. I, you don't see it on cat badges, do you, very no, much? No, you don't. There is a, a cast iron emblem for the hedgehog at the gates of the town hall in ross on oh. i don't think you would know it was a hedgehog unless you knew it was a yep. hedgehog it is a rather <laughs> strange looking creature so 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 may, maybe that um uh, maybe that emblem came first and was adopted by the volunteers or or vice versa who yep. who, who yes. knows who yes. knows um but there were many uh, many towns and cities presented their citizens who served in South Africa with uh, with gifts, didn't they? The recognizing that volunteer spirit. Yes, they did. I, I mean, uh, generally they're known as tribute medals, but they're not all, always medals. Mm. There were tankards, um, uh, small silver medals to go on watch chains, watches, and 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 other things mm. as well. <laughs> Andy, despite not doing much of a walk today, all this talking does rather give you a dry throat, doesn't it? it? It certainly does. And although the sun's sort of shining outside, the wind's blowing an absolute mm. hooli, but I think we ought to go and brave the elements and take a walk up. Well, should we try the, um, the Rose and Crown in Tupsley? Very good. That sounds like an excellent plan. Yeah, it's got a, uh, an association with the military in that it was the uh, uh, the headquarters of the Tupsey Company of the Home Guard during the Second World War. And there's a photograph of the company in the car park there. Oh, which, well, um, I, think we, I think we'll put that on the website. Indeed, we ought to go up and have a look and see what's changed. 
Well, Andy, we're here now at the at the Rose and Crown in Tupsley, and it's looking at the photograph, which um, uh, which listeners can see on the website and links in the podcast description. Very, very obvious that we are in the same building. Oh, it, it's clearly identifiable, although quite a lot has changed. Mm. Where the original photographer stood is now uh, someone's garden, so we can't actually recreate the exact location. But you can see from the distinctive tiles on the roof of the pub and from the houses on the other side of the Tupsey Road, I assume it is, or Ledbury Road. No, it's not Ledbury Road, that's further round. Anyway, on the other side of the road, you can see the houses there quite clearly. But the pub has had an extension build since, so where the troops were on parade would just about be where this um, flat roof extension is now. Now, um, uh, what would the rationale be of having a pub as your headquarters? It sounds a bit, a bit, bit dangerous to me. Would, would much work think, get done, do you think? I think it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I think the pubs were more of a centre for the, the local community in those days. Uh, most of them had skittle alleys or function rooms or whatever, which could be used as a training room. And, of course, th- th- there was a big social element mm. to, this, um, to the home guard. Um, not that they were constantly drinking and partying, I don't mean it like that, but, but to build up the esprit de corps of the unit. Most of the people knew each other in any mm. case, so I think it was quite natural for them to, to socialise and... You know, the, the, the pubs were the places where generally that went on. Mm, absolutely. There would usually be a little bit of land around them, wouldn't they, in terms mm. of any, any vehicles and parades and those sort of things. Yeah. And, um, and also, um, it's quite well located within uh, within Tupsley itself. Yeah, yeah on, in, on the main road mm. and the crossroads there. There was also the, um, the Tupsley Bricks, I think it was called the Tupsley Brickworks, which I think by this stage had fallen out of use, but there were still buildings there and it was used as a training area by the Home Guard. Uh, I think they might even have had a, a small arms range there mm. as well, a, a 25 metre range there, which they could use for, um, uh, for zeroing their weapons. So, again, very much a local organisation mm. tied in to local facilities, making the best of the local facilities. That's right, because, of course, there was very little budget was there for, you know, they weren't building new... New buildings and facilities for the for the Home Guard. It was a quite a, a provisional organisation in that respect. Absolutely, you're you're right. And and most of the uh, the buildings that they used were, were church halls, as mm. I say, the rooms in pubs, whatever, mm. barns in, on farms as well in the more rural areas. There were a few locations where uh, Home Guard huts were built, but generally they were where there was going to be a permanent camp for mm. whatever, mm. or not not so much a camp, but a permanent. Uh, um, uh, station there. Um, there was in in Ledbury, in what used to be called Churchill's Meadow. There was an observation post mm. there, and it was for plotting aircraft movement. Th- there was a fantastic setup covering all of Britain for tracing um, enemy aircrafts which were flying uh, by measuring the, uh, the 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 height the angle to the aircraft mm. from two or three different stations. They could work out the height. They could then work out the direction. And each of these observation posts had their own grid, which they they would follow the aircraft through, pass them through, and then pass them on to someone else. So mm. there was a fantastic tra- yeah. tracing system, which the Home Guard did a lot of. The ATS, uh, the ladies of the ATS did quite a lot as well. Mm. And then the ladies of the WAFs did mm. it. And also, I think the early sort of Royal Observer Corps mm. people as mm. well were doing this. Yeah. They were certainly certainly there, weren't they, on the uh, the rooftops in the, yeah. that wonderful film, The Battle of Britain. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it, it's interesting you talk about, about Ledbury because that's going to be the destination for our next podcast. It is. We're, we're looking forward to that. And, and when we talk about Ledbury, we'll let you into a little secret. We will indeed, but we're not going to let that slip now. In the meantime, Andy, it's been another uh, great, um, not necessarily a walk in the sun, um, a, a walk against the wind, but we've had Certainly a great time. Been, but anyway, cheers, Paul. Cheers. cheers.